Don't applaud yet. You don't know how good this is going to be. So, you know, it could be terrible, and then you'll regret it. Do you know who that is? That's actually a group of uh, outsourcing folks from India. And, I mean, if we look at the, the, the picture there, you know, it's relatively generic because it's not even one particular group. They represent a concept. This picture could have been taken in India, this picture could have been taken in Indiana. Either way, it's a group of people who are working on code. And for many people, this represents a threat. See, when I was a kid growing up, and it was, well, let me put it this way. When I was a kid, the Transformers were still an animated television show on Saturday morning cartoons. That gives you an idea of how old I am. But the exercise, the plan here was pretty straightforward. The idea is you get good grades in school, you go to college, you graduate with your degree, you get a nice job, you get married, you have a house, white picket fence, one and a half kids, right? Nobody ever quite was able to explain what a half kid looks like, but so be it. And the system, quote unquote, that we see in terms of education, in terms of getting into universities and so forth, really, really encourages this notion of study hard, get the right answers, you can be successful. In the States, at least, we have a number of different tests that are used to try to uh, measure, weigh, uh, somehow figure out, quantify your intelligence level. We have, of course, the classic, the Scholastic Aptitude Test, the SAT, we've actually got a preparatory SAT test that you can take actually when you're in junior high school before you even get to high school. If you want to go into law, there's the legal SAT, the MCAT. There's even a test called the Wunderlich test, which is used to try to judge people's general sense of intelligence. As a matter of fact, the National Football League has been known to use the Wunderlich to um, evaluate the intelligence levels of their candidates you know, for draft day and so forth because, you know, it, contrary to popular opinion, you do actually have to have a brain in order to play football. Well, that's what they tell me anyway. We even had tests that were designed to tell you which field you should go into. Back in junior high, seventh grade, ago, uh, seventh grade or so, 13 years, 14 years of age, I took one of these tests and they said basically I should be a priest. <laughs> now, I'm not sure why you're laughing unless you've been out with me at the speaker's dinner last night. But yeah, there's all of these tests that are designed to help perpetuate this notion of go to school, get good grades, get a nice career. But the problem is that the formula is changing out from underneath us in a number of ways. When you look at, for example, some of the graduation rates that are occurring elsewhere in the world, India, 350,000 engineering graduates each year. China, nearly as many engineering grads as the US, and I think actually that number has since been surpassed. Egypt, Brazil, Poland, all of these countries worldwide have begun to realize that in many cases you can get into software development without having to build a whole bunch of national infrastructure. We don't need uh, trains, we don't need railroads, we don't need bridges. Give us a good internet connection and we can work from pretty much anywhere. And based on simple laws of economics, they actually require a lot less money in order to be successful according to their local economy. This concerns a large number of people. Do you know who this is? You're to be forgiven if you don't. There's a lot of American references in here. Sorry about that, but I don't know European legends quite as well as I do American ones. This is John Henry. And John Henry was, well, the classic quote is, he was a steel-driving man. John Henry is an iconic American character who worked on the railroads back when the United States was still laying out the track, connecting up the various parts of the country. And so the story goes, as epitomized in a song by Johnny Cash, if Johnny Cash does a song about you, you're famous, by the way, just so you know. A man came by with a steam-powered drill. In other words, he came by with some new automation. And John Henry, who believed that man was better than machine, 
challenge the drill to a race. And it's an epic, epic story. In the beginning of the race, the drill got out ahead and John Henry fell behind, but then, you know, he spat in his hands, because that's what you do apparently, and started swinging harder and eventually caught up and got all the way to the very end, they're neck and neck. John Henry puts on a burst of superhuman strength, finishes the race, defeats the drill, and dies. I didn't say it was a happy story, I just said it was an iconic story. This is the first case that we know of, anecdotally speaking, of course, automation beating man. Do you know him? Kasparov, yes. Probably the finest chess player of his generation, perhaps the finest chess player of all time. Kasparov had his own little John Henry moment, right? He went up against a computer, computer designed specifically to play chess. He won his first world championship against another human, of course, in 1985. From that point on, he never lost a match until he faced Deep Blue. As a matter of fact, as the story goes in Kasparov's own words, he was so rattled by the computer's play in the, early, in the first round of the match that he just couldn't focus from there on out and basically ended up pulling a number of draws rather than outright losses. And fortunately, he didn't die. But it's still... Interesting, because here we have two individuals, both of whom, can, the top of their field, both of whom are losing to machines. Automation threatens programmers more than all the other outsourcing sources ever could. Automation, in many respects, is what allows people that have not been skilled in a particular field or topic to be able to do things that they would never have been able to do before. The fact that we have all of these tools to be able to consume web APIs and engage in certain reactions, IFTTT, Zapier, et cetera, the fact that we have all these tools that allow people to drag and drop and develop things, et cetera, all of these things are in some way, shape, or form threatening to a lot of developers. Now, in some respects, we wave it off when we say, oh, yeah, but seriously, you have to have a certain level of understanding in order to be able to do this stuff. I mean, after all, it was back in like the mid-90s when Visual Basic 3.0 shipped, and I remember one of the taglines was, now even managers could write code. And do you know what happened? They did. And it really, I mean, if you've ever tried to recover a VB3 project, you, you're probably experiencing flashbacks right now. But the fact of the matter is, this isn't just a programming problem. A number of years ago at a medical conference, there was a fascinating display where was probably one of the first exercises in machine learning and artificial intelligence, where they were submitting x-rays into basically what looked like a fax machine or a scanner. And after some analysis, it was printing out diagnoses. And these people were amazed because, yeah, it was actually printing out some very, very subtle diagnoses. You know, this is dislocated or partially dislocated. Things that wouldn't have expected a machine to be able to do. And it wasn't until later that they realized, oh, actually, the machine isn't doing the diagnosis. The machine is faxing it over to a team of doctors in India who's doing the diagnosis and then sending back the results. Now, some people might say, ha, that, that's clearly not machine learning. As long as the interface was well encapsulated, we don't really care about the implementation, right? At least that's what we always tell ourselves. But this is still, I mean, how many of you have used WebMD to diagnose an illness? How many of you have seen LegalZoom.com, right? These are websites that are specifically geared to be able to do some of the things that doctors and lawyers did. For a long time, it was common for you, for you to have a family lawyer. If you needed to draw up a will, you needed to draw up a contract, whatever, you would contact your family lawyer, they would write the document for you, blah, blah, blah. Today, you want a quickie divorce, $99 and a LegalZoom.com subscription, and you're on your way. Happy divorce. So, question comes up frequently, well, how do we stop this? How do we make this not happen? And the answer is we can't. The machines are slowly taking over. So, what do we do? Well, in keeping with the Battlestar Galactica theme, we evolve. We grow. We take a different path rather than trying to compete with the machine on what it does. Do you know who this guy is? Not the guy by name, but this is the guy that works in your company 
that had that one brilliant idea years ago, and now he's paid simply to sit there and stare out the window to hopefully come up with another brilliant idea that will make millions and millions and millions of dollars. Anybody can, in fact, be him. There's a story at uh, Intel. How many of you have seen an Intel television commercial, right? And you know if I go do, 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 you guys know that, right? That particular sequence of tones. That actually almost never came to be. My wife was working at Intel, as a matter of fact, during the days when they first rolled that out, and that was actually something of a lark. There was a marketing executive inside of Intel who had this brilliant idea to play those sequence of tones as a part of every Intel commercial to establish it as kind of an audio cue that, yes, this is an Intel thing. And most of the rest of the marketing department thought it was the dumbest idea ever had. They actually wanted to go with the theme that they were rolling out for that year's Super Bowl commercial back when they were highlighting the Pentium chip, which was all those engineers in the brightly colored uh, uh, dry suits, um, not dry suit, rabbit, uh, bunny suits, right? The ones you work on when you're in a clean room. So they had a commercial going where these people were all dancing to disco music in this bright yellow, pink, blue, et cetera. Which one survived? The marketing exec that had the idea of the tones, which everybody said, this is the stupidest idea ever, that guy is made man at Intel. He is literally paid to do nothing other than think. And, more importantly to our discussion, he will never be fired. He will never be let go because he had that idea which is now so deeply embedded into Intel's marketing campaigns everywhere. They even play those five tones on other people's commercials just to let you know that it's an Intel chip inside there, just to bring the notion that Intel is what you want back to your consciousness. It's a beautiful bit of brand marketing. Anybody can do that. Anybody can have that kind of an idea. I don't mean that you're gonna come up with the next great marketing scheme, but anybody can do something which will be the perfect solution that solves a particular problem that we have right now. Anybody can be an iconoclast. Person who does something that others say cannot be done. Iconoclasm actually uh, derives from the term uh, given to Leo III. He was actually Holy Roman Emperor. And if you don't remember your history, remember that the Holy Roman Empire was actually established in Constantinople. It was actually the Eastern Roman Empire because, you know, Rome by this point had sort of fallen into basically barbarian chaos. And in 725 AD, Leo was being crowned. Now, you've got to understand that back in those days, the church was a very, very powerful figure in politics. And as a matter of fact, it was not uncommon for kings and emperors and so forth to be crowned by a member of the church, an archbishop, or if you were big enough, right, maybe the pope himself. The implication being that the church is giving you your secular power. The church, therefore, has the power to take it away. Be a good boy and do as the church asks. As a matter of fact, this was reinforced when you go to the man's throne room. When you look at his throne, above him are all the symbols of the church. Again, the symbolism here is pretty heavy. You are here by virtue of what the church gives you. Therefore, be a good boy. Do as the church wants. And Leo, like many of his contemporaries actually resented all of this power that the church wielded in terms of his political story. So he actually literally got up on his throne and tore those icons off the throne. And thus he became known as the destroyer of icons, the first iconoclast. There have been a number of people that have actually destroyed these icons, these notions that, no, you, you can't do that. That's, that's simply not possible. And we're going to talk about a number of them. Now, some of these names you may recognize, and some of them you may recognize, but not necessarily from this particular context. And in many cases, there are lots of iconoclasts who have made the world better. Those are the ones we're going to focus on. There are also a few iconoclasts who have made the world worse. And no, I will not be making Trump jokes during this particular presentation. There's a couple of iconoclasts from within our industry. Uh, of course, one of the big ones would be Linus Torvalds who have released an operating system out into the public back in a time when everybody thought operating systems required millions of man months and millions of dollars in order to ship. But Alan Kay, 
created Smalltalk, created uh, the Dynabook, the first portable computer, the mouse. There are a lot of things that came out of Xerox Park that Kay had his hands in. Dave Thomas, of course, Ruby Dave. Uh, Ruby Dave um, was one of the first persons to be talking about naked objects. Later, he really uh, socialized Ruby to the rest of the industry. Um, and then, of course, he and Andy Hunt decided to go off and make themselves a publishing company, which gives us the pragmatic press. Edward Dykstra, Robin Milner, a bunch of these folks have done things that people said, no, you, you can't really make that happen. Now your goal, very simply, is to become an iconoclast. Because very bluntly, if you can do things that others say simply can't be done, that is a very rare, rare skill. And if you can acquire that, if you can deliver on that, the company will go to great lengths to try to hold on to you for as long as you choose to be there. Because this is something that no machine can accomplish. I don't care how many lines of code a compiler can synthesize, compiler is literally built with ideas of what can and cannot be done. If you can come up with a way of doing things from a programmatic perspective that a compiler can't, well then by definition, we don't want to lose you. You're like useful. The iconoclast sees three different things, sorry, three different things go into becoming an iconoclast. Number one, you see the world differently. You've got a different perspective, a different view. The second is you overcome the fear that comes along with being an iconoclast. And third, you exercise what's known as social intelligence. Okay, great. What does that mean? What do those things mean? Well, for starters, let's talk about your brain. Your brain is a highly energy-constrained device. Look up. Seriously, look up. You see the, the lights up there? They actually take more power than your brain does. Brain operates on about 40 watts of power. You, my friend, are literally the dimmest bulb in the room. Seriously. The brain wants to be able to do all of this processing, but it's only got about 40 watts of power to work with. So in order to maximize the efficiency, it takes a large number of shortcuts. For example, when I show you this picture here, what do you see? How many of you see three black circles? Okay, how many of you see like a, a, a triangle with a white border on it? How many of you see a gray triangle there in the center? Yeah, guess what, you're all wrong. That's three Pac-Men and three HTML tag symbols. <laughs> How do I know that? Because I drew the silly thing. And I can tell you for certain that there were no circles and triangles involved here. What's happening here is your brain is taking shortcuts. Your brain is specifically looking at patterns and saying, oh yeah, I know what this is. It looks very, very similar to other forms of this that I've seen in the past and therefore, it's interpreting it immediately as one of those things. That realization about psychology, it means that because the brain is exercising all of this pattern recognition and then feeding the results to your brain, it means that perception, what we perceive, what we recognize when we're looking at things is a matter of the brain. It's not a question of your eyes lying to you. It is absolutely sending all the same visual information each time. Your brain is taking these shortcuts long before you ever consciously realize it is. But perception is a matter of the brain, not your eyes. How many of you have seen this optical illusion before? Fair number of you, right? The optical illusion is, of course, if I ask you which of these two horizontal lines is longer, your answer is, of course, neither. You know that, because you've seen this before, you know that both of these are, in fact, the exact same length. And as a matter of fact, if you do the finger thing you know, from the slide, you can actually prove to yourself that they are, in fact, the same length. The bigger question is, why? Why do you look at this photo and immediately assume that the top one is longer than the bottom one? Why does your brain kick in to give you that erroneous perception? Well, many of us have stood in the center of a railway watching the rail lines converge off into the distance. 
Many of us have stood at the base of a tall building and watched the building appear to slope to a point at some point in the distance. And all of us that have witnessed that understand that there is this concept of perspective. That where you sit, where you stand, watching things as we go off into the distance, they appear to converge even though they're actually parallel because perspective. That's just the way the world works. And I can prove to you that this is the case because when I show you this picture, you have absolutely no problem whatsoever seeing that those two lines are in fact the same length. Now your brain doesn't really like this picture because it's actually requiring a little bit more energy to try to parse what's going on here. Your brain looks at the first one and says, oh yeah, I know exactly what this is, you bet. These are two things converging into the distance, not a problem. Your brain looks at this and goes, what? What, what? I mean, you've never seen railroad lines do that. And, and if you see a building that does that, um, something really, really bad has happened. Uh, or you're in Orlando. There's actually an upside-down building in Orlando. It's a science museum. Yeah, a couple of people have been there. They're nodding. It's a fun place. You should go. But here, because your brain is taking those extra steps, using those extra precious watts of power to perceive what's going on here, you get a more accurate perception. These two are, in fact, parallel, and it's really easy to spot. It's all about your brain. The most likely way we perceive something will be in a manner consistent with your past experience. Make sense? What happens when you see this picture? Immediately, you recognize this exactly for what it is. This is a picture of the old mainframe applications that we used to build, right? Dumb terminal talking to a mainframe, talking to a bunch of comma-separated value or tab-separated value flat files, right? Some of you are like, no, dude, no, 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 no. Clearly, this is a client-server application where the client is talking to the server, which talks to a relational database. And there's others of you that are saying, no, pff, come on, man. That is a web browser talking to a web server talking to some form of data storage back there. And still others are like, no, come on, that's a mobile app talking to an API, talking to the server. And there's a couple of you that are thinking, how did he get a hold of our top secret architectural diagram? <laughs> this, by the way, is the universal architectural diagram, which I call box arrow, box arrow cylinder. It works for any project. And if you don't believe me, the next time you interview somewhere, just tell them, look, this is the architecture that I know you're working on. And you draw those out, and they'll be like, you're hired, because I don't know how you guessed the answer. This is the universal software architecture diagram. Now, the beautiful part about this is it applies everywhere, regardless of details. The bad part of this is when somebody stands up and draws this on a whiteboard, your reaction is, oh, pff, I already recognize this. I know what you're doing. You're working on a project that was exactly the same as the one I just got off of. Because the brain looks at that, says, I already know what's there, and I don't need to look at any of the other details. I'm good. Thank you. You guys know who this is? He's a Seattle favorite. Maybe you don't recognize him by sight, but you might recognize some of his work. This is Dale Chihuly, and he is probably the most successful artist, not just in terms of the glassblowing space, but in terms of art. Dale Chihuly is a, um, I, to say he's rich is ridiculously understating the case. Chihuly is, um, he's an icon now in the decorative glass space. The studio has about 100 some odd people churning out pieces. If you go into um, uh, fancy buildings, in some cases if you take a cruise, it's very likely if you see a lot of curly Q style glass, it's very likely a Chihuly studio piece. He is one of the few American artists in history to have a show at the Louvre. Now think about that for just a second. We all know what the French feel about Americans. And this is the Louvre, right? This is, this is the place where France like, shows off all of their stuff. And you know, for them to actually not only allow an American to show at the Louvre, but to actually give him a solo space, yeah, that's a pretty big deal. 
Each one of his glass pieces go anywhere from 25000 to over a million dollars. And all of this because he lost an eye. See, Chihuly, he, um, he was hanging out somewhere in uh, the, the California beaches, surfing. And he got into an accident, which actually, I think the surfboard hit him in the eye or something, which damaged the sight out of that particular eye. Now, if you've never done decorative glass, one of the things to understand is basically you get a long steel straw and you go into the molten, molten glass and you swirl it and then you pull it out and then the, the straw is actually hollow and you blow into that and that creates a bubble and then you cap it and you work with it and so forth. I've done a little glass blowing just for fun. But because you're constantly spinning it, you're essentially looking for symmetry because trying to do something asymmetrical is really, really difficult. And prior to Chihuly, all decorative glass was assumed to be symmetrical. Just that was kind of a given. Well, if you don't have both eyes, it's actually really hard to perceive depth. And depth is necessary in a 3D piece in order to des decide whether or not you've achieved symmetry. So Chihuly, while he was recovering from the fact that he lost the use, basically, of one eye, he actually got into a car accident and lost the use of one arm for a short period of time as well. So now the dude's like clearly, you know, up the proverbial estuary without the proper means of locomotion. So he's sitting around and he's like, you know what? Because you really do need both hands. You can't one arm this. It's just, it's not possible. So Julie said, you know what? Screw it. I can't do perfectly symmetrical glass. It's just, I, I simply don't have the capability anymore, so I'm not even gonna try. I'm actually gonna start doing asymmetrical pieces and see where that gets me. And, you know, we go back for a second here. A, those are gorgeous. B, did I mention that he sells each one of those for almost a million bucks a pop? I'd say it's worked out for him. Now, had he not lost that eye, would he have ever actually said, screw it, I'm not going to go for symmetry? No. Do you know who this is? Believe it or not, you owe your life to this woman. Her name is Florence Nightingale. And Florence Nightingale is known for many things. Number one, starting the concept of nursing. Back in the day, nurse, you know, nurses were really just women that assisted doctors when they were doing things. She actually started the concept of nursing being its own medical profession. But more importantly, in 1854, particularly, uh, supposedly a lot of this was happening while the British were engaged in a lot of their colonial wars, uh, Nightingale observed that more soldiers were dying while in the surgery tents than they were in battle. As a matter of fact, it was very common for soldiers not to report injuries because your survival chances on the battlefield with an injury were still better than your survival chances of going into the surgical tent and receiving medical care. And one of the things that Nightingale noticed was that actually those soldiers who were worked on by doctors who had washed their hands first actually had a much better survival rate than those that didn't. Now bear in mind, in the 1850s, the doctor, the surgeon who was working on you to dig out the bullet that had been shot into you was also very likely the guy who cut your hair. Because a familiarity with sharp things meant you should be good for both cutting hair and surgery. So Florence Nightingale basically went to the various medical communities and said, hey, if you guys wash your hands, you'll actually get a better survival rate. And the doctors all said, yeah, right. You're just a woman, what do you know? Okay, sexism aside for just a second, because, you know, we were really stupid back then, she wasn't getting anywhere convincing these doctors of her facts. So she went to Queen Victoria, who was something of an iconoclast in her own right, and she said, look, this is what's happening. And the queen, supposedly, said, well, yes, but men die in battle. And Florence Nightingale, as legend holds, sat down and drew a picture. Specifically, she drew a pie chart that said, this is the percentage of people who are dying on the battlefield. This is the rest of them that are dying in the surgical tent. And Queen Victoria went, oh, I get it now. And established a monarchical rule, basically, that yes, if you're going to be a doctor in the British Army, you must wash your hands before you perform surgery. And doctors can't very well go against what the Queen commands. 
and discovered, lo and behold, that yes, their patients were actually surviving. She, Florence Nightingale, brought this attention to a basic medical fact, and that in turn started the medical industry's fascination, obsession, with making sure that everything is clean before they cut you open and start digging around. Iconoclasts see the world differently. Now, as we've already established, this is not a question of what your eyes report to your brain. It's a question of what your brain interprets. It's a question of how you perceive. Perception is a matter of the brain, which means anybody can change your perception at any time if you are open to it. And there's all sorts of different strategies to do this. Uh, quite frankly, what, what you choose to perceive differently will, be, will depend in many cases on what you're trying to perceive, so on and so forth. But even assuming, assuming that you figure out the magic secret to change your perception, which I haven't found, by the way, that's not enough. It's not enough to just see things differently. You also have to act. And that action is what leads to the second part. Do you know who this is? Yes, this is the Dixie Chicks. For those of you who are not country and western fans, this is actually one of the more popular bands back in 2000, 2001 time frame. The Dixie Chicks, as a matter of fact, they were so popular that pretty much any album they threw out there, immediate bestseller, platinum, five times over kind of thing. The Dixie Chicks were at a concert. Specifically, they were at a concert in the UK. And Natalie Maines, who is the lead singer, she was, during a break between one of the, uh, two of their songs, she was, you know, calling out to this group of UK fans that loved them and said, quote, we're ashamed the President of the United States, George Bush at the time, is from Texas. Now, you've got to remember that this was during the early stages of America's war with Iraq. Right? We had gone into Afghanistan, we'd gone into Iraq, we were supposedly pursuing those that had flown the planes into the World Trade Center and so on and so forth, which was not particularly popular over here um, because we had gone basically unilaterally, we had gone without really establishing just cause, this is the whole weapons of mass destruction, you know, Colin Powell, supposedly we have evidence, blah, blah, blah. To a lot of people, this was not a controversial statement. But to a lot of people, it really was. They received death threats. And these were, not, these were not death threats that were of the sort of, if I ever see you in a bar in my hometown, I'm totally going to kick your ass. No. These were threats like, you will be shot dead at your show in Dallas. Those are the kinds of death threats the police take pretty seriously. They set up round-the-clock protection details. As a matter of fact, there's a story of a, tele or a radio station van you know, they've got these vans that drive around to various locations to offer, you know, giveaways and all that good stuff. Because it had the Dixie Chicks painted on the side of the van, one of these radio station van drivers reported that somebody pulled up next to him on the freeway and pointed a shotgun at him simply because they had the Dixie Chicks on the side of the van. Because you do not insult the President of the United States, this was a necessary war, it was a really, really hotbed of political discussion within the U.S. But first thing you don't do is you don't insult the flag. We're having similar kinds of discussions today with NFL players kneeling for the, uh, the national anthem and so forth. All of this because Natalie Maines stood up and said, we are ashamed the President of the United States is from Texas. Maines never recanted her statement. She never apologized. And as a result, the next album that the Dixie Chicks cut plummeted on the charts. Now, part of the thing to understand about radio, radio station charts is that they are measured by the amounts of popularity in terms of how many times have these songs been played on the radio. If it doesn't get played, it doesn't really count. And the interesting thing about this is their album was the number one download on iTunes shortly after it came out, 2006. So this is about three years later. So the radio stations are afraid to play the music, even though lots and lots of people are downloading it individually. It wasn't that the Dixie Chicks were a bad band. It was that everybody was skittish. She literally, with that one statement, she literally risked everything that they had built in terms of their band, in terms of their album sales, in terms of their following. Think about that. With one sentence, 
You jeopardize everything that you have spent years trying to build in terms of your career. That's fear. There's an interesting psychological problem that helps describe some of the fear that we might feed. Imagine for a moment that I have two urns, two vases, two jars, etc. And in this one over here, I put nine white marbles and nine black marbles. Just don't drop them in so it's pretty well random. Over there, I have an urn similarly mixed, but with unknown quantities. We don't know how many white and how many black marbles. We know there's 18, but I'm not telling you which one or, or what the proportions or the proportions or the ratio are, right? So nine and nine, unknown and unknown. Mr. North, please stand up for just a second. I'm gonna pick on you because I know you. Dan, I want you to pick out a white marble which of these urns do you use? So you're going to go with this one to pull out a white marble. Okay, fair enough. Hold on to that thought for a second. Now, same question, except I want you to pull out a black marble. Which urn do you choose? Okay. And, Mr. North, you know I love you, right? You're an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> but here's the rationale why. If we assume, Dan said, I know there's at least some white marbles over here, and he used the same rationalization, I know there are some black marbles over here. By definition, what he's saying is, I believe that there's going to be more white marbles or better chance of pulling out a white marble from over here than it is from over here. Therefore, I believe there are more black marbles than there are white marbles in this one. Therefore, if this is the best urn from which to pull a white marble, this would be the best one to pull out a black marble. Now, interestingly enough, why you're not the first person to come up with this rationalization, I know what's over here, I don't know what's over here. And this is at the heart of what psychologists refer to, hello, I already did that. This is what's referred to as the Ellsberg Paradox. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. The Ellsberg Paradox. Basically, what's happening here is you are making this decision based on your fear, or the very root case, the ambiguity of what you don't know. Dan said it. He said, I know that there is a certain proportion of marbles over here, so I'm going to go with the known even though the possibility may exist that the unknown stands a better chance. This happens to us a lot. How many of you will choose to drive home the same way every time from work, even though with some experimentation you might discover a faster way? Have you ever been in a case where you're driving down the road and you see everybody getting off at an off-ramp and you say, gosh, I wonder what they know that I don't? It turns out that this is basically some leftover herd mentality. If you walk up to the, the restaurant, or you walk up to the, 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 the side of the building, and you see a whole bunch of people standing in line at that restaurant, and this one is empty, what do they know that I don't? What's, what's going on over there? What's going on in this unknown space? Unknown, bad. Bad means go with the known. Even though you may find out later that that restaurant over there just opened and it turns out their food is worse and all of those people are going to be sick and this one over here, well, nobody likes Indian food so nobody's eating there or whatever, right? There could be all kinds of reasons, legitimate reasons for why one versus the other. But when you're just standing there and you're looking at what your brain is telling you and known versus unknown, yeah, that feels weird. We don't like ambiguity. We fight it. How many of you recognize this craft? How about, do you know it by name? What's the name? It's a space shuttle. Yeah, but it turns out there were about a half a dozen of them. Which one is it? How about if I show you this photo? Now you know which one it is, right? Many of us do. Many of us Americans. Uh, I was actually sitting in ninth grade English class when the Challenger went up. 
And this was one of those marked moments. There are certain moments in your life when you know exactly where you were and what you were doing when you received really, really like eye-popping bad news. The Challenger was destroyed because of a failure of the O-rings that were supposed to seal off the fuel tanks. And of course, the O-rings, as we now know, froze, which meant they lost their flexibility, which meant a gap was opened up, allowing superheated super flame to escape the side booster rocket and ignite the central tank and blow up the entire Challenger. <laughs> now, interestingly enough, the subsequent investigation, headed by Dr. Richard Feynman, or he was a part of, not in charge of, the failure probably began with the faulty design of its joint and increased as both NASA and contractor management first failed to recognize it as a problem, then failed to fix it, and finally treated it as an acceptable flight risk. Think about this for just a moment. I tell you, and you believe me because I have some credibility in these matters for whatever reason, I tell you that there is a flaw in your car's gas tank. And that under certain circumstances, like for example, if it's below zero Celsius, as you drive your car, your car will explode. How many of you, first of all, say, no, uh, no way, it's not there. There's no such flaw, no way. And then even when it's proving, yeah, there's one guy in the back who's like, I don't care. I don't care. I will still drive that car because I'm an idiot. Anyway, the next step is to say, oh, Yes, that flaw exists, but it would cost way too much money to fix it. And then you say, but you know what? It's an acceptable driving risk. It's right up there with getting T-boned at an intersection. It's okay. I know what I'm doing. And besides, right, I, I'm, I'm an astronaut and we're expected to take risks. And how many of you would go through this thought process? Versus say, what? And that's immediately going to the shop to be fixed, replaced, whatever, sold. Yeah, how many of you think it's worth your life to drive this car to and from work every day? But that's exactly what happened with the Challenger. These extremely smart people sat around in a room and convinced themselves, first of all, that it, it was in fact a problem. No, 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 there's no such problem here. Uh, no, no, I can't, you know. We would never expect the shuttle to be taking off in below zero temperatures because in the early stages of the program, they all happen on the West Coast, where it very rarely dips below zero, even in the middle of the night. It's when they started moving to Florida launches, where it can drop below zero, that this even became a remote possibility. And then, well, we could fix it, but it would represent billions of dollars of retooling. And then said, you know what? Yes, it could happen, and yes, it will destroy the craft, but that's just part of the pain of going into space. This failure at NASA is a completely repeatable one, and your company is probably doing it right now as we speak. If you've ever been part of a round of planning poker, where you look at a feature, and then all, each of you writes down a number, the number of hours, or the number of widgets, or the, the, the complexity score, whatever you use to measure the complexity of a particular feature, let's assume you're using the Fibonacci scale, and there's six of you in the room, and so you say, okay, here's feature X, and then you say, all right, what did everybody have for how long it would take? Two hours, three hours, two hours, three hours, two hours, 17 hours. And everyone immediately turns to the 17, and the 17 goes, no, 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 let's do this again. Nope, nope, I was probably overthinking it. I probably was, was not, you know, considering, let's just do another round. And now it's three hours, four hours, three hours, four hours, three hours, six hours. Okay, reasonable, ship it. Maybe you've ever seen that. It's happened. It happens all the time. Because going against the herd is really scary. What do they know that I don't? Why are they all coming up with estimates that are two or three hours and I'm seeing 17? Why am I the only one that holds this viewpoint? Why am I the only one can see it? I must be wrong. Solomon Ash. By the way, that guy is a fascinating character. Um, really interesting history, and he has done some of the most interesting psychological experiments that we've ever seen in the science of psychology. He had a great one 
where he would get volunteers to come in and sit in a room. There's like 12 people in the room. You're number 12 coming into this room, and you're seated in the very back left corner, the last seat in the room. And he shows you this picture, and he says, all right, which of these three lines, A, B, or C, are the same length as this one over here? And the first person says A. The second person says A, and the third person says A, fourth person says A, fifth A, sixth A, seventh A, eighth A, ninth A, tenth A, eleventh A, twelfth A. Some of you even did it here. Why? Why do you say A? Because everybody else said A. Yes, peer pressure. And the fascinating thing was, When you interview these people after the experiment, in many cases it was not just, oh, well, that's what everybody else said, so I figured they must have better information or they must understand the rules better than I did. In some cases, they looked at it and said, no, this really is the same length as this. They convinced themselves of this fact. Now, a fascinating little tidbit to this. Let's do the same experiment because, of course, as you figured out, the first 11 people are all plants they're supposed to give the wrong answer for this particular question. But now, first person says A, second person says A, third person says A, fourth A, fifth A, sixth A, seventh A, ninth C, chooses the other wrong answer. Tenth A, eleventh A, twelfth, now, statistically speaking, you have a much better chance of actually saying B. Because it's fascinating when the entire herd agrees, it's actually very, very hard to work against that. It's very, very hard to step away from that. It's very hard to call the entire herd wrong. As soon as there is some amount of dissension in the room, as soon as somebody disagrees, even if they do it for the wrong reasons, even if they disagree to the wrong answer, as soon as somebody disagrees, suddenly you feel freedom in which to do the same. By the way, when you do this experiment, 86% of the time, if everybody agrees on the wrong answer, so will you. 86%. Especially if you don't realize it's an experiment and what it's designed to test. Next time you're sitting down to planning poker, next time you're sitting around in a room and everybody's agreeing on something, disagree deliberately and watch how many additional disagreements come out of the woodwork where before everybody was willing to go, yeah, yeah, no, this makes total sense, total sense. As soon as you say, I'm not sure, do we really, really want to host the database inside of the client application? Does this really make sense to put a database on the phone? And then people will go, well, you know, I had my concerns, but I figured we'd work them out later. Oh, yeah. You're one of the A's, aren't you? Okay. The law of large numbers. The average guess of a group of individuals is better than any one individual's, and often better than the best individual's guess. This is actually what we see when we start doing those marble, marbles in a jar, count the number of marbles in a jar. If you look at everybody's guesses and then average it out, the average of the guess is actually better and closer to any one person's guess. It happens remarkably often. It's incredibly, incredibly um, common, re- easily repeatable experiment. It's wired into us. Follow the herd. Breaking away from the herd back when we were uncivilized was literally the difference between life and death. Because the herd had figured out which water was clean. The herd had figured out where the food was. The herd, there was a time when banishment, exile from the community, was literally the same as a death sentence without having to actually hurt anybody. So the idea is to get emotions out of it completely, right? Just do what this guy does. No, because it turns out you need the emotions in which to make decisions. You need to. There are uh, experiments where people who have had the emotional centers of their brain damaged, who literally cannot make a decision, even if it's just what time should you come in for your next appointment. This is well documented in psychological history. We need emotions in order to be able to make those decisions. The iconoclast feels fear like anyone else. They simply refuse to allow fear to dominate their actions or responses. And this is hard. The last thing you need to do is you need to be socially intelligent. Do you know who this is? David Hanemeyer Hansen, DHH, creator of Rails. 
That particular slide came from a presentation that he was giving where he was talking about the next version of Rails at the time, Rails 3, where he was actually talking about what features Rails were going to have. And the community had submitted all of these suggestions, and his response was that. Literally, I know better than you, so get off of my lawn. Rails will be what I want it to be and will not be swayed one way or the other. Now, he's done a lot of good things, but one of the things we don't see is we don't see DHH at a lot of conferences. Why is that? Well, because it turns out a lot of people don't like him. They really don't. Similar story. This guy here. He invented FM radio. Now, how many believe FM is better than AM? Show of hands. Yeah, most people agree with that, right? FM, however, at the time when it was invented, AM was the established standard. And when he went out and proved it, his buddy, these guys were on speaking terms, his buddy was president of RCA, which was heavily invested in AM. And Sarnoff deliberately sent his engineers out to write papers and to create technical situations in which AM was considered the technologically inferior solution. And Armstrong proved over and over and over again that FM was better. And still this guy basically said, you're a crackpot. You don't know what you're doing. And he died penniless and alone because he never actually got to see FM take off. Shortly after he died, the other media companies, the other radio station companies, slowly converted over to FM until today it is basically the dominant radio technology. But he could never get anybody to believe him. You need people to understand what you're seeing, but more importantly, you need to exercise what's called social intelligence to get them to buy into your vision. If you see it right, and if you're willing to face the fear, it's all for naught unless other people jump onto the bandwagon with you. Two painters, both of them generally considered great masters, Picasso and Van Gogh. Picasso, rich, admired. As a matter of fact, Picasso was one of those guys you always wanted to have at your parties. He was, he was just absolutely a fascinating character. Everybody loved him. He was very vivacious, very interactive. Van Gogh cut off part of his ear and sent it to his would-be girlfriend. Just the kind of guy you want to have at your party, right? <laughs> Both of these were considered master painters. One knew how to exercise social intelligence. The other did not. Social intelligence consists of two basic things. One is familiarity, and the other is reputation. Familiarity is how well do you immediately recognize that guy? You know who that is? And if you say Severus Snape, you don't win. Alan Rickman, absolutely. For years, Rickman, up until the Harry Potter trilogy, Rickman was one of those that guy set of actors that you recognized, but you never could remember his name. The brain likes familiarity. It likes seeing things that it can recognize over and over and over again, which is why these actors are frequently seen, but you can never remember them until they land that one breakout role. Within the social intelligence world, there's this concept called shadow networks, networks of people, networks of, of groups, tribes, if you will, that all know each other and can communicate with one each other. They recognize one another. This environment is one such tribe. There are people like Dan that you see at a number of these engagements. You're like, oh, yeah, 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 I, I know that guy. I want to go to that guy's talk because he's brilliant, probably because he agrees with everything I think, right? Because the people who are smart are the ones that agree with you. You've all noticed that before, right? Right? Go like this. See, you're all so smart. Your reputation, particularly for that of offering up a fair deal in these networks, is absolutely critical to being able to leverage people, to get people to agree with what you're saying. The combination, familiarity and reputation, is what allows you to connect with people and get them to eventually believe in you, and therefore believe in your vision. The iconoclast is somebody that will never be replaced by any particular technology or by any particular tool. If you can become an iconoclast, if you can see the world differently, if you can stare down your fears, and if you can leverage social intelligence to get your message out, you will be one of those people that your company would never even think to get rid of. The end.
That was awesome. Thank you so much. I know I went a little long. My apologies, but I know you did. It's I was trying a to lot of material signals. to try to cram into 50 minutes. I know. That's, and you did a great job, so thank you for that. If you have any questions for Ted, stick around. He'll be able to answer them. Um, right out there. Otherwise, next talk start in about 15 minutes. <laughs>